Um, so I just want to welcome everyone who came out tonight. Um, thanks so much for coming down from Morrisville, right? Okay. And um, Jari, and for you guys um, agreeing to read tonight, um, I'm going to have Katina read your introductions, and then you guys can go first. I think Jari, you're going to go first. Yeah, I will. So thank okay. you all. <sighs> so. Jari Chevalier's poems are forthcoming in Arturas, Puerto del Sol, Green Mountains Review, and U City Review, and have recently appeared in Beloit Poetry Journal, Boulevard, the Cincinnati Review, Gulf Coast Online, the Massachusetts Review, Poetry East, and other journals. Her poem won the inaugural poetry contest at Sheila Nagig Online, and she was a semi-finalist for both the 2015 and 2016 Tomas Solomon Prize. Jari has received a merit award in the Atlanta Review International Poetry Competition and was a finalist in the 2014 Plowshares Emerging Writers Contest. She holds an MA in Creative Writing from CCNY and has taught for SUNY Purchase and Antioch University. She is also a visual artist, and samples of both her art and poetry can be found on her website at jarichevalier, all one word, dot com. And she lives in Moncton. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and inviting us. Uh, Annie and Carla, thanks for the introduction. So I've got poems for you tonight that um, are all about being uh, an observer of nature and phenomenon in solitude. That's what sort of brought this, the, that, that's what brings these together. And this first poem, uh, for those of you who ever go to writing workshops. This poem actually came out of a writing workshop I did with Dina Metzger in California. And the exercise was to go out on the property. It was a, a single day, a Saturday workshop, and to just go anywhere on the property and see, just be open and see what sort of calls to you, what, what draws your attention, and then to engage with that and, and start your writing from that. So I uh, I was pulled in by uh, an outdoor bird cage. <coughs> Looking in, I am drawn to the cage, something exotic, spiced by another world, a kind of lovebird. When one turns away, the petals of the palest cream rose bloom on its neck. How can a yellow so electric be pastel? This is the underlength of a tale. Why this desire to devour them, mouth full of feathers, free them into the vast oblivion that I am? What's there in their wrinkle-lidded swivel vision, some inarticulate promise of sky and body, broken and broken by a grid of catastrophe? I know a dwarf macaw that sleeps between Elizabeth's breasts, who picks a flake of skin ever so gently with his beak from her nose. Is this how I love? And I have taken a wrong turn and wondered, am I lost or in a blessing? And small with uncertainty, parked the car and entered a steel warehouse door on a barren industrial lane. The sign on the place, this is how we're loved, advertised <coughs> the one obscure thing I've been looking for. The nature of the beast. All week I had wanted the beach 
deserted, to see no human form as I walked, to make a pretense of frontier so there would be no obstacle to the miracle if I should vanish into daisies or out across the sea, no one to hold my body in the thick of human vision, a body that wanted to thin its tissue and mesh with the gauze of other matters. But it was eerie to be out there alone, this alien morning, before sunup, after last night's storm, the sand all wrestled into swirls and every tire rut and footmark filled in. I slid down dunes, the moon rolling its head across my back, turned to face its visage. Where was the mouth that sang vowels two nights ago? Eroded bluffs, moonshine glistening everywhere. Is everything the ghost of something else? The whole was folding into itself, turning forward and away. Titanium sea, orange blue, molten. Did someone whisper, hey, in my hood? Pipers come, rim of sun appear. <clears throat> Unkempt graveyard near the shore, trespassing on ground of former love. Tussocks whisper here of nests and the vanquished. Swans hiss and fish nearby, undoing the slipknots of their throats. Cool, eroded, greening headstones. Wetlands with no relief from tides. I come here often to wonder how to live and listen. Clean. The sea is astringent and dries in salt lace. On the rocks peaked up like beaten cream, the morning tide whisks the tide pools clean, and snails amp up their suction on rock. Dazzling gown, wave, my heart is your wild tangerine rose, freed from the tight green fist of its bud. I used to live um, just across uh, Route 1 in Rye, New York, from a, a marshlands preserve. And um, the property directly abutted a big golf course. And um, for a while, I wanted to get up before the sunrise because it's just a very, very magical time <coughs> for the seabirds. They, you know, everything starts happening and they're so excited. And so I would go there at that time and watch the whole process, but I was going to be late this morning, and I wanted to just run down and cut in, run down the golf course and cut in, and I was completely stopped by seeing a blue heron in the golf course pond. Poised in her elegant lean, Watching the underskin of the steaming pond, she is a study in patience. I stand enchanted by her long stillness, my body planted there, fast inside, wondering how badly the water's tainted, considering the perfect lawn all around and what it takes to discipline this wild ground. One quick jab, one tear at the chiffon water, and she is swallowing whole a thrashing fish. Then she moves, giraffe-like, and quiet, a tender frog gliding towards the other shore where the insects mumble, is scissored quick now in her classical beak. Dark doilies of trees on the water the fish and frog dissolve inside that fine blue Buddha. Suddenly, my presence comes to her, 
and she snaps out her startling other shape. The wings spread, she works to the feather tips. I see her fly into the lightest spot, far into the only day as it breaks. <clears throat> A housewife waters her house plants. Grabby little roots, succulent and thirsty, seethe in the tense soil she's just watered. Cells of petals, sectioned like tripe, draw trace elements through the pith as a flute lures the cobra. Where the wind blows them together, the leaves slubbing from the sun, the drug that it gives them, kiss and kiss. And the sticky green blood sorts its cash. Some of it stone crushed beyond her ability to see. She wonders, are there impulses in stone that quicken at the roots approach, that hear some call of the green imagining to climb to the endless hidden leaves inside? Words of an abstract water lily. <clears throat> The thing to climb to? A kaleidoscopic view held to this dominant eye. A future that draws the mud light we're all sunken up to the motives of sunlight and wind. For every stem with the will, there's a last dull lengthening, then a coming to, passing up through the lips of lake water, where from the broken clutches of our own butts, delicate interiors flare. Words of a dying stingray. <laughs> Where did you go, my self-lived waves? I'm beached, a laboring lung that was, just before, electric in a made-for-me domain. Now raw air through shocked valves, my stinger tail whips at grit. Washes of soft surf tease, then nothing. Go ahead, come near, pierce, tear at my numbness. It feels good in a strange, exquisite way. Everything fading, including me. What's going on? Horses mosey across the black lake at the center of the sunflower. I turn away when the pink sun sharpens its claws on the mountain. Light blinks at the tips of leaves that suffer their sights underground. Straw is beaming drum beats back into stars. The zippers of feathers are rejoining for flight. Alone in a beer bubble, a sweating violinist links and undoes a chain of numbers. Shells are building themselves in the sleep of seaweed. It costs too much, so we don't pay attention. A reindeer stag is rubbing moss off its head branch a weapon whose incipience was pure imagination. Matter imagines its future. This is how change happens. Desire becomes motion, becomes texture in time. You know, I've lived a pretty unconventional life, and I've gathered no moss. <laughs> I've lived a lot of different places, done a lot of traveling. And um, there was a process of coming <coughs> to make Vermont my full-time home. Um, I had an apartment in Manhattan for seven years and was kind of going back and forth. And um, so the beginning of this poem refers to 
leaving the urban life. Uh, although a lot of the poem refers back to other places I've lived and other times in my life. But it's called My Calling. Jack hammered morning and starless night, keep yourself. Who never got out of bed till noon was a despot. A bit of chalk or talc or cake, a small catch or clasp there in a voice I'd grown to love, hardly recollected. Persimmons, heavy in the orchard, glutted with their own starch and sweet water, thud to the ground, split, the pool too cold to go in by then. How does a body cinched into sections like that even talk to itself? Three ants struggle to drag a dead one. Welters of sorrow rise to pitches that urge even broken wings to fly. <coughs> I excel at so long. <laughs> Shadow of the cupola on whitewash across the way. Wood grain in a beat bleeding a peninsula on the kitchen center island. The brook racing, tumbling in a gully beyond earshot. Quails with decorated heads purr and scoot across the lane into my raised glass bottom. One more dip and turn in this music and I won't be there ever again. Had I a career, I might be famous for calling in sick. <laughs> and during the years in New York, I did some volunteering uh, at uh, Bellevue Hospital, and at, around, those, around the same time, my aunt was uh, dying in a public nursing home, so I kind of crunched the uh, experiences together into this uh, fictional poem fictional expression. In the public nursing home, I listen, lean closer, sudden rank odor of yellow or missing teeth, dry lips quiver in attempts to retaste her past, drawing hard on frayed neurons, scrambled sequences, fugitive faces, her eyes cast down to the right, mist train, spade in soil, squinting there, watery for fled memory, drowned vocabulary, moist who, what, where, inscrutable steam. Gelatin thickened orange juice in a plastic cup on the laminate swing table next to her. She cannot swallow a liquid anymore. Bewildered bluebell eyes rise to mine. I pick up her crumpled, cool bone hand, crazed with gray-green veins, and say, doesn't matter, did you love? Did you ever love? Like most of us, I'm really concerned about the, uh, the loss of species and the threat to uh, life on the planet, including ours. And this, uh, this came out of that. Magma. An iguana tanks into mosaic shade on an island hill. Wind swizzles through grasses, and peepers cheap up in trees come dusk. I imagine our ever-shared circle of fusion elevate, sizzling from that turquoise horizon, exciting all the finches with lyrics of light, rooster on a broken wall, clarion, primordial. Sea mists, sea mists are in-breaths of pelican and palm. Sand is broken shark teeth, coral, bone, shell, stone. Digested plants morph to muscle, cartilage, collagen. Fire makes lye and, ma and lathers. We eat and breathe the dead. Even if nothing now living survives, sudden blue voltage and lava within them 
have it to begin again. One can only hope. <laughs> okay, the title of this <clears throat> is sine qua non, and that's a fairly commonly used Latin phrase that directly translates to without which not. So we say sine qua non to mean, you know, if you don't have this, you, you're not going to get that. And for me, this, this relates to um, their perception of beauty in, in everyday life. I stop to eavesdrop on arpeggios of a spotted egg in the grass. My eyes trace up rivers of bark, chest pianoing for the nest, green flutter there. And later, when I add a silver bowl of oranges to a blue-white tablecloth washed with flutes of violet light, a bow draws low across a cello, and tomorrow dew warms to nothing in nasturtiums, honey from a turn of spoon needles into teacups of ghosts and violas. And this is the last poem. Uh, I don't know if you know that song from Camelot, that, that famous musical. Um, I'm not a good singer, but if ever I should leave you, it wouldn't be in springtime. It goes through the different seasons. And this poem is my homage to the natural world, particularly the forest and the forest's love for its creatures, if ever. Sop, loam, humus drawn upon by trout lilies, ramps, spring beauties, and towering forms that share themselves with moss, beetle, fungi, lichen. Roots wriggle in concert with bird dreams of woven strings and vines tucked in cruxes. Glittering star-lustered insects munch on plentiful leaves, take wing, get eaten. Tree massacred by woodpecker team, none worrying. Seed pods split, arousing wind wakes, silks shining. Forest sees all at once, with owl eyes, fox, deer, porcupine, mine. Are they mine, or just the earth's? White bark, shaggy bark, vertical bark, gnarly bark. <laughs> Russet floor, then air from north. Snow crumples on rill stones, ice wafers, trickle unders. New sentient soon unfurls. Tender orange newts bust out everywhere, forest singing, never would I leave you. was born and raised in Seattle, Washington, the descendant of early Oregon pioneers. Her work has appeared in The New Republic, Poetry, New England Review, Slate.com, and other venues. She has been named a Poetry Fellow by the New Hampshire Arts Council, and she received both the Thoreau Fellowship and the ALSCW VSC Fellowship with the Vermont Studio Center. She is at work on a full-length collection and lives with her family in Marsville, Vermont. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks to Jari for inviting me to uh, come over. It's a wonderful friend. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, uh, these are going to be um, just sort of random selections from the manuscript that I'm working on right now, which is called How to Use Your Eyes, or at least that's the working title. Mm -hmm. And so you'll notice as I go through probably um, the themes of looking at things, what can you understand from the world around you, 
Um, is it really as um, clear or as obvious as it seems to be? And those investigations could be scientific, they could be religious, they could be familial, um, kind of all over the map. Um, this first poem is uh, sort of engaged with one of the um, debates that's running around the poetry community right now that you may be familiar with, um, sort of narrative poetry versus non-narrative poetry, and how much can language really mean? Um, can we trust it, and should we sort of be as passe as to, you know, want to tell something as simple as a story? Um, I tend to feel that that's what humans want, so I fall on that side of the, of the debate, if you will, or the conversation. Maybe it's better to call it a conversation than a debate. Um, so this is called, After Reading the Narrative is Dead. On one of those unmarked back roads, I stopped for a fat yellow turtle of a bus, and one student got out. A boy in overalls who crossed in front and began walking down to a rusted bridge, empty bottomland. I know he doesn't mean anything, and no signs exist in this world, but he carried a white square of poster board pinned under one arm, wind twisting the edges, showing the underside, a surface mostly blue, as if he carried a piece of sky into a brown field. Now it's late, the boy slipping in and out of mind. Sometimes he throws his picture away, his teacher a pussy, no time for freak shows. Sometimes his overalls couldn't be more cliched. Farm chores and obstacle he'll ditch one day for good, driving down the same dirt road. In the trunk, this painting, dozens more. At that hour and, and, and in every other, thanks to relativity pervading space, perspective, every degree of form and color, any conclusions at which we might arrive, Multiple endings keep occurring to him. Now he's taping his work beside the bed, where it recedes from sight as he falls asleep. A window left opening on the wall. Um, I have a, a sort of a fascination with persona poems and the idea of kind of slipping into somebody else's mindset and trying to see where they might be coming from, of course, as a way of understanding our own lives, right? So um, one of the figures that I'm sort of fascinated with is um, a prophet called Tiresias um, in Greek mythology who, um, and I don't profess to be an expert on him, but one of the things that I find fascinating about him is that he spent time as both a woman and a man um, as a curse for killing some snakes and or wounding, depending on which story you uh, read, and that he also was blind, but he was a seer. He was able to see the future. He was able to see um, uh, what might happen to a person. Um, and he was, uh, after he died, he was the only person in hell or Hades that retained his sight because he had second sight. Um, he couldn't actually see, but he was able to still tell the future. Tiresias in Hades. No one here remembers who they loved. Can't bring back the rooms where they woke at night, got up to drink, or who said, I'm scared, or let's fuck. Imagine a window broken into panes, divided by dozens more, then split without end, and you spend your time looking through every pane, the watery world through watery glass, mind over mind spilling over, Lullabies sung for the deviant in his cage. Who sent the village up in flames? Where to find a dead girl dumped under blackberry vines? Some mornings while she's still in bed, I see the daughter of my daughter's girl, who thinks for a moment the starlings have stolen her name, are tossing it around in air, just to hear it hum and break. Even my own story multiplies, there I am, a boy examining his beard. I'm reaching down to feel my daughter's head as it crowns between my legs. I give my husband a kiss, my mother the duty of a son, 
and here are my old prophet hands. If you want to know which path to choose, if you wonder who you were, I can only tell you all of them. Um, I have a series in the manuscript that we're sort of exploring different aspects of biblical thought or um, alternative pathways. Um, I was raised in that tradition. This is called Gospel According to Someone. In this one, nobody dies. God eats the apple, calls it good. Adam and Eve sail down the Euphrates, decide one morning in a strange harbor that they just want to be friends. <laughs> Outside the former capital, surrounded by her sisters, a virgin gives birth to Herod, who grows up unharmed, builds an inn, calls it paradise, and only one guest arrives, a man with no arms and no eyes, and Herod feeds him bread. In an upstairs room, the archangel appears to herself in a mirror, wipes away the steam, And in the series, uh, sometimes human speakers speak, sometimes um, objects or other um, beings speak. Um, it's very far away from fall, but I th if you've ever seen um, the tamaracks that hold on to their gold at the end of the season, this is gospel according to tamarack. For so long, summer, quiet as a drug, ten feet deep in leaves, no reason to raise your eyes. Now the lake assembles a skin, a little more shade over the hill. And when the days are washed down dull, I'll break into flame for you. I tell you, you haven't missed a thing. We're lit votives, a guilt hoard. There's still time to apprehend even the smallest brightening be visible for miles around. Gospel according to human clone. The papers always got it wrong. No metal rooms. I never spoke with invisible gods behind a one-way mirror. I did once see the lock of hair, the dress, which could stand of its own accord, as if it remembered. Someone walked me past her manuscripts, held open under glass, the hand somewhat familiar. Now I'm grown, I do the paperwork alone, in a coffee shop, waiting for the train. I've come to see all existence as translation. Sometimes I even prefer the earlier version. Do I constitute progress? I can tell they're waiting for me to bloom. Lately, what I like most is to ride the buses at dawn right out of the city, telephone poles beginning to flick the sky, my face suspended on the pane. Bits of cloud arrange themselves like notes on the wires where one could write the most magnificent score in a key previously unknown, even by the next me. Gospel according to my windshield. Out there in the field, a billboard. God listens in on every thought. Static, dust, railroad tracks, deliver me from radio hours. Hotel a thousand testaments ago, elevators bored sigh. How many feathers under my head? How many rocks in the road? In bedtime stories, Dad used to say, heaven could be infinity, and we'd find a billion of him reading sky and telescope, his spectacles thick as bottle glass under the desk lamp. Our Father, give us your lens. Up ahead, the interstate, tungsten haze collecting over the ramp, little stadium, a game most Friday nights. I'll be the one pointing headlights past the stands, wishing consolation to victors and the stunned, dependent as they are on one another, registering mill towns, neon lights, 
bugs dancing across all night grocery screens, water towers, empty drive-in lots, statues leaning into dusk, man slapping a boy outside a Greyhound bus, this profusion sliding over nothingness. I've also been playing around with some um, political-ish poems. Um, I don't. This isn't really in the manuscript. This may be this leading edge of, a, of another book. But um, this is called Long Siege, and I think it's about war. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> long Siege. The long siege over, we entered the smoking garden, found the dictator's body half burned in the grass. Further on, his trusted advisor, a failed burning also. The advisor's children, as if sleeping in their bunks. Lying on its side, a dog, loved by the dictator, as if before a hearth, dreaming of mice in the field. I should say this is in short sections, so I'll pause between each one. Under an ash pit sky, we stirred the bank of coals, finished the burning. Dog, children, men, poured like meal into wooden boxes, buried under a nameless structure. Coordinates filed on official shelves. The long siege over, neighborhoods waited for the dead to return. The missing burned like bulbs all night on in our minds. Convoys of insomnia each memory a live round. Believing in times of peace that peace should flourish, in the old location we met once more. A vote for exhumation is a vote for explication, we said, a vote for once and all. So the long siege would always be ended. We brought up the boxes, sifted. Through our sieves, armies drifted. We buried them again. It would be true to say the matter returned from time to time, even with the long siege over. Someone sobbing in the night, someone muttering over basement dossiers. It would be accurate to say we rose from our beds, gathered the tools at our disposal, dug once more, buried, dug up again, buried, each time the ash fine as flour on the tongue. New positions, protocols. In recognition of another jubilee, we can report that we laid the fires one closing time, freshly crushed and burned all crates, fragments, soot, tipped the balance into a stream that flows through the old industrial quarter, joining our national river, pillow of silt dissolving where the long siege was once declared to be over. I'll read um, two more. Um, I spent, like, um, like you said, I was raised in Seattle. I've spent most of my time um, separated by 3,000 miles, an entire continent, from uh, most of my family. Um, and so this poem is, um, I don't know, contemplating my, my father, and it takes place in a lamp shop. House of Lights for Larry Fogdahl. Did we visit somewhere like this once? A hardware store. We need a switch plate. Or maybe we're killing time. The bus is late, our movie canceled. Did I touch a wall of yellow dials? Your lab, father-daughter day. As if down the paper tube I used to spy on neighbor kids, singled out, but nothing magnified. The early dark eats memories. Cars outside flick on their lamps. Across the ceiling, fireworks in a row. What's that thing they say about depressives? We can't handle the dark. Then give me the heavenly host, this makeshift Rococo chapel. Isle of fairy dust, isle of heat, 
Isle of Summer Nights at the dinner table, where you tell me sight is sun rewriting the eye. How light doesn't shine through my fingers, or creak willow leaves, but joins, for a moment, the shocked fabric of matter, escapes on the other side. So when scripture said, thy whole body shall be full of light, God wasn't kidding. Out the window, one red warning blinks at the radio tower tip. Unstoppable fields firing up the avenue. Street lamps, car lot, beacons on wire. If I want your voice on my phone. In the beginning, the word. And your words go farther back than any I can remember. Past the rim of what I know to say into the silence where we disappear. Not all light is visible, you once explained, assuming I would understand. And if that's true, I'll close my eyes now, wrapped in the body's combustion. Girl at the register, ready to switch off the lamps. Man parking under the sodium beam. And you, wick of a father, I'll bring to another night. The road home. Always a junkyard rusting under big trees. The horse surrounded by wire fencing. The billboard half torn away. Always the barn door left open, revealing the elderly tractor. The mailbox hand lettered, waiting for some kind of dispatch. The coast sends more fog. Always everything covered in blackberries and ivy, badly done stitching. Leaves rotting away, pocking the grass. Always the layer of needles and moss on the roof. The idea of little trees starting to grow there. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Anyone, would you guys be willing to field questions if anyone has questions? Sure. Anybody? <laughs> Maybe uh, each of you can share about your writing practice, um, kind of a daily writing practice. If you have a strict schedule or if it's more uh, depending on other circumstances. <laughs> yeah, I I don't write every day, but um, I have other art forms. Right. You know, I, I do visual art, and um, yeah, there are times, uh, intense times, when I'm involved in a project or involved in a, you know, kind of a an impetus or or a, a need. To, to write, and then I can be pretty intense about it. And I do like to go on residencies where that is kind of expected, and I've asked for the time, and everything else is put aside, and then I can be really productive. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I, it doesn't show up on my resume, or in my biography, or on any you know, it's just not something that comes up all the time, but I have a 30-year meditation practice, and um, that really is the center of my life. Mm. So, quiet in the mind and just pure perception is actually more important to me than expression or saying something, but the time comes when... Uh, that's the natural thing to do, and I, I definitely yield to that at that time. Mm -hmm. Beautiful way of saying that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I uh, have a pretty demanding job that isn't um, that isn't poetry. So I, when I can, I try. I like to have um, that regular time every morning, and I try to make it if I can. I know a lot of people swear by, get up, do it, no matter, you know, no matter what's going on, it's like exercise, you have to, you know, um, do the scales, if it were piano. 
and I would say that if I had the time, probably that's the more my um, temperament, if you will. Mm -hmm. But I can't do that, so it has to be more um, come and go. Uh, I like to revise a lot, and I'm a really slow writer. So, um, you know, it's not uncommon for me to have 50 drafts of a poem <laughs> over, you know, a five, even ten year period. Um, and it can go a really long time without looking at it, and I actually really like that feeling of coming back to something after so long because you often see something in it that you didn't realize that was that the real nugget of it. Um, and so sometimes it's that, uh, at least I need that distance in order to have that recognition. If I'm too involved in it, um, I'm still in my own way somehow. Thank you. I also have lots of drafts <laughs> so, <laughs> to finish Are you something. handwritten or are you working on a typewriter, uh, a computer? No, well, yes, way back in the old days it was the typewriter, but now it's computer. Mm. <laughs> Anybody else with questions? Yeah. Um, do you have a, a space uh, that you go for your writing, or are you on the fly, kind of just as you see, and that's where you decide to write your poetry? Like a physical space, a yeah. room or something like that. I have a, a studio in, in the house, that, um, but it's also where I do all my other work, mm -hmm. you know, paying the family bills. And <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, not, it's not an idealized space. <laughs> yeah, I also I have a standing desk in a corner of my general living space. Um, and I've lived lots of different places, as I mentioned before, so there's always just that, that spot. Um, and, you know, I sometimes write <clears throat> with pen and paper in my chair. So it's like the chair or the standing desk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. All right, well, thank you so much for coming out. Thank you, thank you so much for coming.